<laughs> and the next item of business is members' business debate on motion 10278 in the name of James Dornan on Save the Hamden Roar campaign. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on James Dornan to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, move this motion today. And before I, I start on what I'd like to say about the situation, I'd like to give a huge thanks to the following people. Jed O'Brien, who is a Scottish football historian and also was a man who opened the Scottish Football Museum at Hamden. Graham Brown, who uh, leads Hamden First, which is looking to get recognition for the very first Hamden of three stadiums, which is now the Hamden Bowling Club and Joan and Ali McHugh and the rest of all those that participate through Hamden Collection and Hamden Rower. I want to highlight this important issue with, within my constituency and it's the current situation regarding Hamden Park. The media has informed us that there's a possibility that the SFA will not renew its lease for cup games and international matches and leave for pastures new, although to be fair, recent reports suggest the deal is close, which will keep the SFA at Hamden. If so, we must ensure that the future of Queen's Park is assured. I'd still like to place on record, though, the serious and negative impact it will, would have on the south side of Glasgow in particular, if indeed the SFA were to leave for Murrayfield or elsewhere. Mike? I certainly will. Bruce Crawford. Mr Dorn will, will be aware that I'm a car carrier member of the Tartan Army and have been for many, many, many years. And I fully understand why he's involved in the campaign as a local constituency member. But I just wonder, though, in terms of the SFA's future at Hamden, in what way will it benefit Hamden Stadium for the SFA to buy it over and be, be, and be owners of it in future to improve what's already there? Because that's really what most people want to see from the Tartan Army perspective. James Dornan. I think that's a very good point, and I mean, I have some doubts about, uh, about the way the SFA have went about this, and, and uh, my hope and expectation, to be quite honest, is that if, if the SFA are getting Hamden for the song that they appear to be getting it for, that there is a commitment from them and others to redevelop uh, over a period of time to make sure they work with appropriate bodies to uh, make sure that transport to and from the stadium is better than a lot of supporters are claiming. I can't really say I've got that problem as I can walk from my house, so uh, it's not a, a major issue for me. Um, uh, so my constituency incorporates, among other areas, Cathcart, Mount Florida, Battlefield, Langside and Newlands, and all of them would feel the economic impact if these changes were made. But it's more than that. Hamden's part of the nation's psyche. It's been an integral part of day-to-day -day life for Scotland since its construction in 1903. It's more than a stadium. Some call Old Trafford the theatre of dreams. But for us, we have the, if they've got the theatre of dreams, then Hamden was a platform of hope, or for many football fans, deepest despair. The stadium is, though, the fulcrum of the history of Scottish football. My own personal memory is my first memory of Hamden is the 1961 Scottish Cup final, first leg, nothing each, eh, against Infermline. We then get beaten the replay, which I was kind of, I hope you're not gloating here, Minister, I'd be very, very upset. <laughs> <laughs> eh, where, where the Celtic get beaten the replay, which I missed because I had homework to do. The 65 Cup final where we got our revenge and beat Dunfermline 3-2 and Billy McNeil scored the famous goal. Scotland versus Czechoslovakia where Tommy Hutchison scored with that magnificent header to put us through the World Cup for the first time in 16 years. And Celtic versus Leeds where there was 130,000 at the ground to see that magnificent 2-1 victory for Celtic to get us into the final of the European Cup again. Hamden's the world's oldest continuously used international ground and became the template for all modern stadia that has followed it. There was three Hamdens, as I said before, settling in its current incarnation that had a peak could hold 185,000 people. And it's a structure that marks the epicenter of the footballing earthquake, which according to football historian Jed O'Brien, made Scotland the founders of world football. And the history is fascinating. Now many people will tell you that football was created by our neighbours down south. There's no doubt at all that the oldest football association was the English FA, established in 1863. But it appears that the first club to play football was called, very aptly, the Football Club, and they had their first games in Dalry Park, Dalry, 
the first known football club in the world was indeed from Scotland. And also, you may be surprised to hear that the first football act was enacted in this very parliament, if not in this building. I was looking around to see if Stuart Stevenson was here, but in 1424, James... <laughs> those two statements were not in any way connected, presiding <laughs> officer. Uh, James I passed a law prohibiting football, or as it was put in Old Scots, of playing at the football. Uh, so we wind the clock forward to... I certainly will, John. Are you? Right. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member very much for giving way. And his, his looking backwards in the history is absolutely fascinating. I just wonder, looking forward, though, some people would feel that to have three major stadia in Glasgow is just too much and is a luxury we can't afford. How would they respond to that? James Dornan. I would respond to that by saying that Glasgow has for a long time, this, is, this hadn't suddenly appeared out of the blue. We've had three major stadiums in Glasgow for longer than my life, and my life has been quite long so far. So uh, I, I really don't see that as being an issue, and I see it as being something that people who are trying to get Hamden to be closed down or the, or the SFA to move is using to hang their hat on it. Now, the, the, in, the, in the summer of 1867, they just, a group of men from the local YMCA were playing what they called football. These men turned out to be Queen's Park Football Club. They were passing about a ball in an open park with a bundle of old clothes making the goals. Hundred years later, kids like me were doing exactly the same thing, whilst 11 men from a radius of 30 miles from Hamden, and Parkhead to be fair, won the European Cup in Lisbon. The irony is that the Queen's Park are so proud of what they've achieved, they hardly tell you about it. It's just part of their DNA. They believe that anyone could come up with it, and a quiz master once said that it's only easy if you know the answer. And they did. They thought, why wouldn't you pass around an opposition? Why wouldn't you have tactics? Why wouldn't you have half time? Why wouldn't you play 11 aside? And Queen's Park run from Hamden, dominated the early game until the rest of the world copied and caught up. They were aptly called the Scotch Professors. They are the founders of the beautiful game that is currently enjoyed the world over. Now, in 1872, the 30th of November, 1872, which will ring a bell for uh, many of you, the 30th of November, not 1872, uh, the world's first inter international football match was played, and it was between Scotland and England. Queen's Park played on behalf of Scotland. Coincidentally, that's another centenary uh, celebration for another Glasgow club, one of those two that have got a stadium in Glasgow when Rangers beat Bayern Munich in Barcelona 100 years later. But, this, but football is about histories and it's about personal memories. And Hamden is a place where I have seen players the likes of which the world have never seen. Maradona, Pele, Zidane, Law, Cooper, Dalgleish, Larson. These are only some of the greats I've witnessed in my lifetime. However, there's hardly a family in Scotland who won't have some sort of memory of a game played in this wonderful stadium. Families huddled around TV, the country's eyes fixed on this national landmark. The teams lining up as Scottish Cups were won or lost. The national side seconds from making it to the World Cup. The Tartan Army gathering in the stadium in 1978. Uh, to see off the Tartan Army and the uh, Ali's Army and the folks at home filling the atmosphere from Hamden to every living room, the length and breadth of this country. And that is why I'm proud to be the voice of Keep Hamden Roaring in the Chamber today and why we must keep Scottish football at its national home, and that is Hamden. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to the... Um, the open debate. Now, we're really pushed for time, so I'm going to have to insist that people do not go beyond four minutes. And I call Kenneth Gibson, followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like first to congratulate my colleague James Donnan on securing this debate. For many, including me, Hamden Park is not just the home of Scottish football, but a shrine, the scene of many fond memories of incredible club and international games, world class athletics, and iconic music performances. Looking back, I formally remember watching umpteen Scottish Cup finals from Hearts versus Rangers in 1976 as a toddler to Celtic Motherwell in 2013, missing out only in the old firm games in between uh, and enjoying some incredible matches such as Motherwell beating Dundee United in 1991, Gretna's loss to Hearts on penalties in 2006 and of course my own team St Mirren defeating UEFA Cup finalists and perennial Cup final bridesmaids Dundee United in 1987 and I remember even watching back in the midst of time a League Cup match between uh, John Mason's Clyde and Queen's Park and who can forget international matches such as Scotland versus England back in 1978, just before the World Cup in Argentina. Scotland attacked relentlessly for 90 minutes against a Catanaccio-minded England, who, as I recall, crossed the halfway line only once 
and scored an absolute scandal. Or Scotland qualifying for the 1990 World Cup by beating France 2-0. Fabulous night. Regardless of who wins, there's no denying the electrifying atmosphere at Hamden, even after the old cout became all-seated. Hamden not only holds special importance for Scottish football fans, but has attracted supporters from around the world as host of three European Cup finals, two Cup Winners Cup finals and a UEFA Cup final. Hamden Park is not just a world-class stadium, but a record-breaking one. On consecutive Saturdays in 1937, Hamden established two records which remain unsurpassed. On 17th of April 1937, the first all-ticket Scotland match attracted 139,415 fans, including, I am told, a youngish Bruce Crawford. A British record for any match who witnessed Scotland scalp England at 3-1. A week later in the Scottish Cup final, a crowd of 146,433, a European record for a club match, crammed in to watch Celtic beat Aberdeen 2-1 while, while 20,000 supporters were locked outside. Another record was set at 1960 European Cup final, which saw 127,621 spectators witness Los Blancos win their fifth European Cup in a row, 7-3 against Eintracht Frankfurt, the highest attendance at European Cup final. And 10 years later, as James Don has already mentioned, 136,505 people saw Celtic beat Leeds. 2-1, uh, uh, a record for a European Cup semi-final crowd. Over the years, renowned musicians have chosen Hamden as a stop in their world tours, including Tina Turner, Bon Jovi, George Michael, the Eagles, Bruce Springsteen, ACDC and Beyonce. And rumour has it that Jackie Bailey even saw Robbie Williams there, albeit as a guest of BT. To lose Hamden is unthinkable. As a totem that benefits Glasgow's economy and standing, it would mean the loss of an iconic building, envied as the largest of the world in the world when the present site opened in 2003. Sorry, 1903. Of course, there has been legitimate criticism of Hamden's facilities. Upgrades could be made to enhance the safety and enjoyment of fans. However, I believe much of the criticism made of our national stadium is unjustified. In terms of alternatives to renewing this S Scottish Football Association's lease, the only realistic uh, options would be Murrayfield, the home of Scottish rugby, Ibrox of Celtic Park. However, neither of the latter two options would be reasonable, requiring the SFA to pay Rangers or Celtic rent and thus offer a financial advantage to the two wealthiest clubs in Scotland, Rangers' recent history notwithstanding. The team housed at the stadium in question would know that a final or semi-final would likely be played at their own ground, offering an on-field advantage. The same issue doesn't arrive at Hamden. Queen's Park is an amateur team, gaining no sporting advantage for the income uh, on the lease. Presiding officer, a sacrilegious move to Murrayfield would make travelling more difficult for fans living in the West Coast, such as my own Cunningham North constituency, and involve money previously invested in football going to rugby. This means a fan ticket price would no longer trickle down to grassroots football or into funding Queen's Park, Scotland's oldest club and former footballing giants of the Victorian era who might not survive. For 115 years, Hamden has been at the heart of the Scottish game, the scene of good days and bad days for Scottish football, great games and big names, historic cup success and some magnificent finals. Hamden Park is a stadium to be proud of and its historic legacy must continue. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Willie Coffey. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I add my congratulations to James Dorman for securing time in this chamber for this debate and I, I really welcome the opportunity to contribute. As we've already heard, everyone has their own personal experiences of, of Hamden Park, and, and I'm no exception. I've seen many Scotland matches there, uh, cup finals, having Olympic football matches there, where I took, took my youngest to her first ever football match. I have even played volleyball on an inflatable volleyball court on the Hallowed Turf prior to the Scottish final in the late 80s as an apparent pre-match entertainment. And I have to be honest with you, it's a phrase, Deputy Presiding Officer, I thought I would never say aloud. Um, I have been to many concerts dating back to the late 80s when I, I, I saw the Rolling Stones from the terraces standing next to, to Billy Connolly, no less. Uh, at other concerts of ACDC a couple of times, Oasis, U2, Bon Jovi, Nickelback, who incidentally I'm going to see tonight, and I have a spare ticket if you fancy it, Mr Dornan. Um, I was every night of the athletics during the Commonwealth Games to witness the Hamden Commonwealth Roar, uh, and I introduced my youngest and middle daughter to Usain Bolt in Hamden Park in Glasgow, no less. The list of special moments in Mr Dornan's motion conjures up many mem memories and emotions. I especially remember Zinedine Zidane's winning goal in the Champions League final, left foot on the volley, 18-yard box, top left corner. Surely I'm not allowed to be that good. That's, to me, that's tantamount to, be che to cheating. But sport and music does that to us. It, it's not just about watching. It's about that well of shared emotion in a crowd. It, it's that feeling we get when we witness something incredible, live, shared by 40,000 plus others. Every time we see it or remember it, those emotions rush back to greet us all over again. 
So I have a great deal of sympathy uh, for Mr Dorn's motion, and, and I find myself torn to a certain extent because I remember the debate prior to the refurbishment of Hamden Park back in the day when an alternative was to build a new multi-purpose stadium out at Strathclyde Park. And from a pr practical perspective, it made a bit of sense that, that the transport network was made easier with nearby motorways, there was plenty of space for car parking, a stadium that could be used daily would be a much better use of public funds, the facility would be better to build modern standards, and on and on and on. And it made absolute sense. But in the end, it wasn't Hamden Park. So the old stadium was refurbished into what we see today, and, and in there lies the dilemma. Sport isn't just about practicality sometimes, as, as, as we've heard today. This is, this is a deep-seated deep accompanying passion that bubbles along underneath. So do we look at the financial implications of, of, of shared facilities with, with rugby at Murray Park, Murrayfield, which is a fantastic stadium. I, I love going there to see uh, rugby internationals. And uh, uh, Hearts played there for a while, while it was being reworked, and, uh, of course. But I've got to say, Murrayfield, is in Glasgow, and I'm a West Coastie, so I have to be able to say that. Do we move from a built-up and a congested area, an area that if you're starting from scratch, you would never consider for an international stadium? Or do we once again back nostalgia and history and emotion? Maybe perhaps a younger generation would develop their own nostalgia no matter where the games are played. To be honest, I, I don't know. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, is a, a head versus heart here, and, and I will watch this story develop, and, and, and as my opinion maybe will take shape. I have to say, when it comes to sport, I would always follow my heart, Deputy Presiding Officer. Willie Coffey, followed by Joanne Lamont. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and thank you, to, and thanks to you. Congratulations to my colleague James Dornan for bringing Hamden, the home of Scottish football, to the attention of the Parliament. Um, like other members, I want to look back at some key moments in its history uh, that I had some involvement with myself, and also to see if we can look forward to what a future Hamden might look like. My first recollection of going to Hamden was for the 1970 Scottish Scotland England International, along with my brother Danny, to see Scotland and to see our own Kilmarnock player Billy Dixon playing left back, alongside great players like Jinky Johnson and John Gregg for Scotland and Gordon Banks and Bobby Moore for England. An incredible crowd of 137,000, which when you think of it is nearly three times the size of the current Hamden capacity, all basically in the same space as today. I can remember actually being squashed in like sardines, even though we were down at the front with our flask and our sandwiches. A clear penalty claim not given for Scotland and a 0-0 result meant the owners were shared. Next up, 1976, St Etienne versus Bayern Munich, the European Cup final and Glasgow becoming European for the days up to and after the game, taking full advantage of the more liberal continental licensing laws that were denied us Scots at that time. Ali Lever was the cry around Hamden as the Scottish supporters got behind the underdogs. Alas, to be dashed by the wonderful Gerd Muller, who scored the only game for Bayern. But from that point on, I retained a fondness for St Etienne to this day. And I know they, brought the big, they bought the big square Hamden goalposts that denied them twice that day. Lastly, in my reminiscences, the 2012 Scottish League Cup final between Kilmarnock and Celtic. A late Kelly winner caused near hysteria of joy at the Kelly end. For all of us, only moments later to be hammered by the sad news that Kilmarnock star Liam Kelly's dad had suffered a heart attack and later died after witnessing his son's finest achievement. Does all this stuff matter, presiding officer, in the debate? Well, I, I think it does. History and tradition are a crucial part of defining who we are as a football nation. We are collectively the sum of our parts and our past. And you can sense that the Hamden tradition is very much alive when you go there to see the national team. The excitement of a Scottish Cup final is still as intense as it always has been. And that, in my view, is also due to the sheer magic of Hamden and a Cup final day. So is there a better stadium than Hamden for Scottish internationals and Cup finals? I don't think so. But we shouldn't hold back in thinking what more we could be doing to the stadium to make it one of the best stadiums in the world fit for the 21st century. We certainly need better transport links for the fans, as James Dornan mentioned. Some stadiums have transport services come right inside or alongside their grounds, and many have leisure and retail facilities embedded within the stadia complex, and some have magnificent overhead canopies which make the atmosphere even more electric. So why not Hamden? 
Hamden is still and always will be the one true home for the Tartan Army. Long may it continue into this century and beyond. And congratulations again to James Dornan for supporting Hamden and bringing it to the attention of the Parliament. Thank you. Johan Lamont, followed by George Adam. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Sorry. Can I congratulate James Dornan on securing this important debate to the Evening Times campaign and to all those who have supported it and have argued the case. Um, I perhaps should start by declaring a personal interest. Given that my husband is Councillor Archie Graham, who represents the area in which Hamden is sited and has been vocal in his support for maintaining Hamden as the centre of Scottish football, I'm not sure if I would be welcomed home if I did not take the opportunity to join with others in highlighting the importance of keeping the Hamden roar. Um, the case against Hamden, as far as I understand it, focuses on the quality of the stadium itself for spectators, and some of that has been mentioned. I personally have had the privilege of watching many an exhilarating game um, in a fantastic atmosphere over the years, so I'm not sure if I agree with the, the naysayers. Indeed, the first Old Firm final that I attended in 1989, Joe Miller scored, and I discovered that it was possible to traverse 100 metres of the terrace and without your feet actually touching the ground. And that resulted in my being probably the only person in the ground that hoped there would not be another goal scored. But I've never forgotten the excitement of that. But I recognise there are concerns, um, but I don't believe these concerns are grounds for the massive upheaval suggested. They are eminently fixable. And I trust the dialogue between the Scottish Government, the Glasgow City Council and the SFA can easily apply a resolution to these. In contrast, the case for staging at Hamden is overwhelming, in my view, on historical, emotional and economic grounds. And I would give a particular shout out to Queen's Park Football Club, who I think have been unique in Scotland's footballing history. Hamden represents not just a football ground, it's the home of Scottish football. It's a place of past footballing glory. The Scottish Football Museum, based there, is wonderful testimony to that. It's a football ground into which national funding and national pride have been invested, and these are significant. But it's also of huge financial significance to the local area and to the broader Glasgow and Scottish economy. It's estimated that in 2007, the UEFA Cup final brought £15 million into the city, and the Olympic matches that have already been referred to in 2012 are assessed as bringing in £7 million. I cannot overstate the impact on the local retail licensing and hospitality businesses of its existence, on local jobs. Hamden employs a lot of people, and many of them are local people who are doing a good job there. Hamden attracts football, as we've heard, concerts, conference, conferences, and is also an important part of Glasgow's success as one of the top sporting venues in the world. And we cannot underestimate the importance of Hamden and sport to the broader tourism economy of, Scotland, of Glasgow and the west of Scotland. So in my view, there is sentiment, yes. There is history, yes. There is emotion. But there is also the direct impact on Glasgow. And the SFA cannot make a short-term decision when what it perceives to be its narrow interest now, given the national interest and investment. The local community, Glasgow and Scotland, deserve better than that. And I'm sure we can make the case that the Hamden roar continues because it stirs our emotions, but also creates economic opportunity for our city. I call George Adam to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to take this opportunity to thank James Dornan for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And as a football fan, this is an important debate. Uh, there are many opinions in the debate w w uh, with this regarding our national stadium, but for me, the most important thing is our national sport should be played in our national stadium. And I admit my opinion on this issue are purely emotional. It is. Is it the best stadium in Scotland? Probably not, presiding officer. Does the area and community struggle during a full house? It can be challenging, but what a day out you get when you're there. But all this misses the crucial point. It is the home of Scottish football, the home of Queen's Park, who were a giant in the pre-professional early days of football and effectively invented what we know now as the modern passing game of football. And for me, it's a place where I watched a young Diego Maradona at Hamden in 1979. 
It's where I've watched St Mirren win the Scottish Cup in 1987 as a young man and where we won the Scottish League Cup in 2013 as a not so young man. It's where every young football player dreams of playing, but most importantly, it's where our national team plays and I love the place. Scotland games for me and Stacey is a day out where we go to the south side of Glasgow and enjoy the full day out. I'm lucky my wife loves football uh, from that perspective and you can't say romance is dead because she enjoys it herself. But the whole idea is that it says back to exactly what Joanne Lamont was saying. We help the local economy during these days by going out there and spending the day out. And it's also a place, Hamden for me, is where I've watched my dad's previous uh, apprentice amateur winder, Archie Gemmell from Glenburn and Paisley, play. And also, I do remember him from that fantastic goal in 1978. It's about the only part of 1978 we all want to remember right enough. But it was fantastic. But Queen's Park, as James Dolan says, created the beautiful game. And it is important we remember that this is their home as well. But you cannot give up this type of heritage. Personally, I know what that's like for a football team, because to move from your spiritual home, St Mun left Love Street in 2009, and our new home was fit for the 21st century. It was shiny, it was new, but it lacked the history, the passion for the place, and the atmosphere. Only now, after a change of ownership, and a lot of hard work from the younger fans, has the, have these issues been addressed? The young men and women who have been involved in a lot of this call themselves the North Bank Agro not in an aggressive way, it's just a name they call themselves. But many have never even been in the historic North Bank in Paisley. And that shows you why history in football is such an important thing for everyone else. But, presiding officer, this is our national game's home. We need to look at ways of making this magnificent old stadium better. We need to look at ways of making sure that we can make the uh, things uh, easier for people to travel to and from the stadium itself. But you do not give up in the history that this stadium has. You cannot lose that passion. It's part of us and it's part of our nation's history. And what we all must ensure is that that grand old stadium is part of Scotland's future. Graham Simpson, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also thank uh, James Dornan for securing this debate, saving the Hamden roar. James Dornan debates always force me to talk about football, so here we go again. Um, the SFA does have a decision to make about where the national stadium will be after 2020. And as a keen football fan, and supporter of the newly crowned SPFL champions, I also have fond memories of Hamden and its roar. But I'm talking about uh, the Hamden that gave birth to the wall of noise before it was tamed by the refurbishment of the stadium back in the 1990s. As I was sitting down to write this speech, I took time to reflect on some of my own memorable moments of high drama in Mount Florida over the years. Uh, my first visit was as an 11-year-old when I was taken to the 1975 Cup final between Celtic and Airdrieonians in Billy McNeil's last game, and there's the programme. Not only was there a sense of history, but the atmosphere to me, anyway, as a boy, was incredible. Ten years um, after that, I was present at the Scotland-England match, which Scotland won 1-0. There's another programme. <laughs> Now, I haven't, in general, got a great memory for goals or goal scorers, but I remember well Richard Goff soaring majestically to head past a static uh, Peter Shilton, and Hamden did indeed roar. I watched highlights of that game at the weekend, and the noise, even through my computer, was incredible. We were in the stand for that one. My dad wasn't one for terracing, uh, but once I'd moved to Glasgow as an adult, um, I would usually opt for the standing option, even if it meant getting soaked sometimes. And walking down Aikenhead Road on match day back then, you felt the hairs on the back of your neck stand up with the noise rolling down off the old terracing in anticipation of the duel ahead. Sadly, times have changed, and not in my view for the better. The new stadium is soulless. Fans are miles away from the action. The wall of noise is gone. If you're at the back, you'd be better off watching at home, uh, watching it on the telly. Sure, it's had its moments. Um, Brian Whittle mentioned the Zinedine Zidane goal, and of course there were Lee, Lee Griffiths' two stunning uh, free kicks against England last summer. Uh, and of course there was the moment, Deputy Presiding Officer, when I took to the pitch 
in a five-a-side competition, sharing it uh, with one of my heroes, uh, Danny McGrain. Now, uh, that was one of the finest moments. <laughs> I, I don't, though, get excited very often about going to games at Hamden. The SFA does have a tough decision to make, and it looks as though it's down to two choices, Hamden or Murrayfield. Yes. Joanne Lamont. It's clearly it's being so cheery as keeps you going, but can I, can I ask you, does the fact that massive, massive amounts of public money has already gone into Hamden, does that not weigh heavily with you in terms of making a decision to move? Can I remind members to speak through the chair, please? Graham Simpson. So um, I hadn't been to Murrayfield until Celtic played a couple of European games there, and I was, um, I, I was super impressed. Uh, and I do remember coming out of the stadium and thinking, this, this should be the national stadium. I realise I'm out of step with everyone else in this debate. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, today, um, the SRU uh, made, a, made a pitch uh, for football to, to, to move to Murrayfield. And if you can put any anti-rugby bias aside, then... Uh, surely having a national stadium in the capital does, does make some sense. It's probably best that I sit down at this point, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. Um, I hope the SFA get this right. Um, the Hamden Raw is a bit of a distant memory, unfortunately. Um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> You're a brave man, Mr Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> Call Fulton McGregor to be followed by James Kelly, and that will be the last two contributions to the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Um, and today in the Chamber, but apart from uh, Graeme Simpson's uh, contribution, uh, you've heard overwhelming uh, support for uh, keeping the home of football at hand and something that I also support as well. But I think in broader society, there is actually split opinion. And my office manager, Alan Stubbs, said that you know, when I'm doing this speech today, I had to mention him, and we've had very robust conversations in the office about it, particularly when James Dorman's motion, particularly when James uh, Dorman's motion came along. But and just to, to thank James for bringing this uh, particular this uh, important issue to the to the chamber. The way I see it is as well, it's, it's about history, it's about heritage, as others have mentioned. And if we lose the home of football being at Hamden, then I think we lose part of our national identity in the game. And whatever people's decision, not decisions, whatever people's thoughts on uh, the Rangers situation where the rights and wrongs of it, something was lost um, when the club moved down the divisions, I think, in terms of the game. And I think if we lost Hamden as a national stadium, I think it could be very bad for the game overall. And also think about it as if, would there ever be a suggestion that the parliament here should be moved to another city in the country? That Wembley should be moved to Birmingham or um, Newcastle? These, these sort of things. Um, you know, I think there would be a, a, a big uproar in these things as well. And, George Adam talked about um, the situation at St Mirren, and that's a, a club that's turned itself around. And there's no love lost between me and every football club being an Albion Rovers fan, but um, Airdrie, you know, I, co I come from the bit of Cope Bridge, which joins to Airdrie, and everybody knew that in, in match day, Airdrie was a very busy place. The stadium was always booming, and the MD sports clubs that went to see them would know that when they were in the, the old Broomfield. When they moved to the new stadium, they've not managed to get that back. So that sort of situation can happen. And, and I, I agree with what everybody else is saying. You know, it, we don't need to get rid of the stadium, it, get rid of the, the being the, the, the home of football. I think Bruce Crawford mentioned it. Um, John Lamont, many others have mentioned it. It's about fixing what the issues are. The issues seem to be around transport. That's something we could surely fix out by working with the council and the SFA. Um, and you know, also the inside the stadium as well. There's, there's, there's scope there for refurbishment. Um, I believe in accessibility for everybody else as a supporter, as a player, and that's something that we're doing through the cross-party group. And I'd like to, to take this opportunity just to, to thank the SFA for the, the great work they're doing on the cross-party group and also to the members looking around the room that have came, in, came into the meeting. And uh, also not to forget, as others have done, Queen's Park, um, one of our oldest clubs. Um, OK, I probably should be forgetting them now since um, they, they done my own team, Albion Rovers, last week. And, um, you know, but uh, on a serious note, I wish them well going forward, and I think that um, they need to be taken into account here because that would be a massive part of our heritage as well. If, if Queen's Park is lost, I probably should take the opportunity to say, uh, unlucky to my own team, Albion Rovers. We only spent one day on the bottom of the table, and that was the day, that was the last day, and we went down. 
there's a lot of exciting things in the pipeline. Uh, people know that Hamden is going to be hosting games at the European Championships in 2020. Really looking forward to that. Hopefully we'll be there and we can actually go and support Scotland. But if not, as others have said, um, then they'll, they'll be hosting games anyway. And it'll be an absolute uh, brilliant thing for our country and the, the city as a whole. And I'll finish with that, presiding officer. Thanks a lot. Uh, James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wasn't going to speak in this debate, but I've been, I've been tempted into it. Um, and I want to congratulate James Dornan on securing the motion on the future of Hamden. I think it's an important motion and it's an important debate. Like everyone else, I've got great memories of Hamden. Um, I first attended a Scottish Cup semi-final in April 1972. Celtic Kilmarnock, and I remember the excitement going to the ground, the packed crowd. Uh, the atmosphere, uh, and I remember that World Cup game that James Dornan recalled in September 1973, where Scotland qualified uh, for Munich, and what a fantastic uh, occasion it was. I think, uh, if the in terms of moving forward, I think if the choice on the table is between Hamden and Murrayfield, then there's only one winner in that sense. It should be Hamden. Um, like Graham Simpson, I attended those those games. Uh, back in 2014. Um, I was impressed with Murrayfield as a stadium, but I did actually think that they, they struggled transport-wise in terms of dealing with the volume of people coming through from Glasgow on both of those occasions. So I think there are, that there are potential transport issues, in, incidentally, in Murrayfield, as well as the clear emotional attachment uh, to, to Glasgow. However, I think there are serious issues uh, to be addressed here uh, going forward in relation to Hamden. Uh, I don't actually think that the current set up at Hamden is fit for purpose as a proper modern national stadium. Um, if you look at the aerial shots of Hamden now and say compared with the 1960 European Cup final between Real Madrid and Eintracht Frankfurt, the, a lot of the infrastructure is the same. The main stand uh, if I say it outside, is, is, is very similar. And the terracing the, that was there in 1960, is, a lot of it remains with just the seats um, built on the top. Um, I remember in the 70s when I used to come, come to Hamden as a kid and we would get up to the top of the East Terrace and, and it was really exciting. And the, 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 I don't know, it was just part of the occasion that the... The team seemed so far away for the pitch. The only player you could recognise was Jimmy Johnson because he's uh, blazing red hair. Um, but the reality is now, in terms of trying to attract modern uh, people to a modern stadium, I don't think that that's good enough. And I think there's also a practical point. Um, if we want to, you know, get back to those great, particularly those great Scotland World Cup occasions, I think you need a stadium where everyone is much closer to the park. The problem with, with Hamden is you've got the, 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 the athletics track around the edge. The seats, particularly the front, are very low. If you sit there, you just see a, a lot of legs running about in front of you. The back, you're too far away. So I think there are real issues for the SFA going, going forward in terms of remodelling Hamden and making sure that we've got a, a, a national stadium fit for purpose. Call Aileen Campbell to respond to the debate for up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would also like to commend James Dornan for securing this debate. I know it is a topic as a football fan and as the constituency MSP that he cares eh, passionately about. And many of the contributions we have heard today have also highlighted the proud history of Hamden, the unique role our national stadium has in Scottish and indeed world football. There are countless incredible moments which are now woven into the fabric of our game. Cup finals, international goals, moments of drama, excitement, joy, and of course, as many have outlined, despair. And there have also been memorable occasions which have resonated beyond our shores, and many of them set out in James Dornan's motion. And including as Brian Whittle also spoke about Hamden witnessing one of the greatest cup final goals in 2002 when Zinedine Zidane scored that very unforgettable volley to win the Champions League for Real Madrid. And in 2020, it will again host its first international tournament fixtures for the UEFA European Championships. Of course, all guests will receive a warm Scottish welcome, but the celebrated Hamden role will be all the louder if Scotland can be there at the men's team's first major final since 1998. And I know despite some of the disagreements we've had this afternoon, I'm sure that's something that we will all agree on. 
This afternoon, though, has reinforced that Hamden, the home of Queen's Park, holds a unique place in football. And I join members in celebrating that history. And of course, the stadium has also played a crucial role in the success of the 2014 Commonwealth Games, which meant, unfortunately, it missed out on the finest Scottish Cup final, where St Johnson, of course, beat Dundee United. And it has, of course, also hosted concerts by some of the biggest names in music. And I think Kenny Gibson revealing, I think, this afternoon that he was a bit of a Beyonce fan. I'm not sure if he mentioned that, meant that or not. <laughs> However, as James Dornan and other members have uh, highlighted, discussions about the future of Hamden are now underway. The SFA lease on the stadium comes to an end in 2020 after the European Championships. And the association has embarked on a process to consider where its Scottish Cup and men's internationals should be played. The SPFL will also consider where its showpiece League Cup fixture should be held. And of the options initially considered, a peripatetic solution involving Celtic Park or Ibrox and, of course, Murrayfield was, dis uh, was discounted, leaving two remaining anchor tenant options uh, available, that being Hamden and Murrayfield. Two separate SFA work streams are now being considered in detail, exploring the pros and the cons of each. And we expect the SFA board to make a decision in principle later this summer. And although we are here this afternoon to discuss Hamden, I would like to briefly mention Murrayfield because it too is an iconic stadium, a world-class venue, which has also hosted some of the most memorable moments of Scottish sporting history. It has also successfully hosted football matches, including Hearts fixtures earlier this season. And I know that the SRU has put forward a strong case to, uh, for Murrayfield, which the SFA is now actively considering. And we have been actively engaged on, the, on this issue with a range of stakeholders for around 18 months. However, we have emphasised at the outset to the SFA and to Queen's Park that our preference is for the decision to be a consensual one, one made and owned by football with vision and ambition at its heart. But in that, of course, we fully appreciate the significance of this decision to members, particularly uh, Mr Dorn and others, and football fans. It's a huge issue of symbolic importance to the nation. And we recognise the enormous challenges for the SFA reaching a decision on the issue as emotive and as high profile as this. And there have been, of course, a wide range of views expressed today. There was Graham Simpson, and of course there was the rest. Uh, but we do need to uh, acknowledge that fans and the football family will also themselves hold a range of views that may differ from one those that we've heard this afternoon. Because yes, Hamden is a great venue, but there also remains, as others have outlined and acknowledged, remains concerns about the fan experience, uh, particularly in the stands behind the goals and the transport difficulties. Uh, and of course, again, members underline those concerns today. But we know the association is taking a robust and thorough approach to this decision, carefully considering all the factors while they navigate through all those views that are expressed. They continue to have our full support in working through the complex process that will allow them to make a final decision based on the best evidence that's available to them, including the financial dimension. But it's also important to emphasise again the importance of the issue to Queen's Park, as uh, James Dornan, Kenny G Gibson, Fulton McGregor and others have expressed, because it can't be overstated. The Scottish Government recognises the pioneering role Queen's Park has played in the development of the modern game and the unique position that it holds as the sole amateur club in the professional leagues. Its contribution to Scottish football alone is enormous, from former players like Sir Alec Ferguson to Andy Robertson, who played in a Champions League semi-final last night uh, for Liverpool. The future of Hamden is inextricably linked with the future of Queen's Park, and the stadium holds a special place in the heart of the club. And we know how important this is to the president, the board, and everybody at Queen's Park, including the fans. Now, the club has agreed in principle to sell the stadium to the SFA and I know that that is a huge step that the club has taken, not taken lightly and we know how, because we know how important the stadium is to, to them. So, presiding officer, I've set out the SFA process for reaching this crucial uh, decision and we have actively engaged throughout and will continue to do so. We recognise how important this is for the SFA, for Queen's Park, for Glasgow, for football fans, the football family and indeed the whole of the country. Football is our national game and of enormous importance to all of us and our constituents and our communities. 
Presiding officer, sir, presiding officer, this is a difficult issue. I'm aware, as all members are, that Scottish football faces many challenges on and off the park. However, it is also important to recognise the breadth and depth of the excellent work taking place in football, much of it going unrecognised, because just last week, Stuart McMillan and this Parliament hosted a reception to celebrate the work of the SFA and our cashback programme, inspiring uh, young people and helping them to fulfil their potential. The SPFL Trust and individual trusts and foundations associated with our clubs deliver incredible activity, complementing the work undertaken by clubs of all sizes in the parts of the country below the SPFL who do so much good in their communities. It's also important to recognise that the women and girls uh, playing and watching, the number of girls and women playing and watching football is also growing. And the SFA is creating the world's first affiliated national association for para football, which will ensure people of all abilities can also fulfil their own potential. And members also mentioned this afternoon the fantastic work of the Football Museum, which is based at Hamden, and which we recently worked with uh, on the excellent Football Memories Dementia Project. And that was also a, a project recently celebrated in this parliament with the, uh, the acknowledgement of the publication of the book Mind the Time, which is an anthology of football poetry um, uh, edited by Jim McIntosh, the poet in residence at St Johnston, and a celebration of uh, fans and what football means to people and communities across the country. Although I know for Willie Coffey's purposes, he will have been happy that we sung Paper Roses in one of the uh, chambers, which is of particular relevance to Kilmarnock. So, presiding officer, today's debate, whilst focusing on the future of Hamden, does give us a chance to celebrate and reflect on all that is good in football, but also gives us a, a, a chance to make sure that when we look to the future, that we do so with ambition and with vision. And we'll continue to keep members updated as this uh, vexed issue around the future of Hamden continues to be uh, examined by the SFE. And I thank again James Dornan for bringing this important uh, issue for discussion this afternoon. That concludes the debate and this meeting is suspended until half past two.